Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome Senior Pastor of 3C Ministries, Pastor Bert Pretorius. Therefore, I want to continue with what I was sharing on. Save me live and multiply. Save me go and possess. Save me choose life that both you and your descendants, hallelujah, may live. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's why I know that you're anointed. So God wants you to live and multiply, go and conquer. Now, what we did touch on, and I want to touch on that a little bit today. I want to speak about seedless fruit. So remember last night, I just touched on a few things. Today, we are more practical in the application. When we're speaking about live and multiply, what does that mean? When we're talking about going and possess, what does that mean? When we're talking about loving people, what is loving people? It's got nothing to do with your feelings. You understand? Because the Bible says that you need to love your enemies. So it's got nothing to do with your emotion or feelings towards people. It's got to do with a decision that you make that you're going to live for somebody else. 1 John 3 verse 16. It says, in this we know love in that he laid down his life for us. He says, ought we not to lay down our lives for the brethren, for one another? So how do we know love? We know love in that he laid down his life for us. He gave his everything for us. And this is how, well, this is how we need to love. Amen. How do we love? By laying down our life. So unless... Foolish one, unless the seed is put into the ground and dies. What must the seed do? It needs to die, right? So once you have died, you become, Romans 12 verse 1, you become a living sacrifice. Say it me, a living sacrifice. Say it me, a living sacrifice. So you alive dead or dead alive. Are you hearing me? So we're alive, we're living in Christ, we're alive, but we're dead to what we think we are. We are dead to, you know, the physical understanding that apart from God, there is no sustainability, there is no multiplication in anything we are and anything we do. Like we read last night, the world is the footstool. It's the footstool. There's nothing we can do to impress God. You understand? Nothing you build, of, and God goes, whoa, you're so awesome. You understand? There's nothing that you build. And it doesn't matter, even if we get to that place where we get to Mars and we build some, some thing on Mars and we on the moon, what does that mean? What? You understand? Now, yes, the purpose in building and, and us understanding and, and going forward as, as mankind and exploring, nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, that doesn't make us something. doesn't make you a somebody. I mean, God says, ah, Mars is my footstool. Mm, the earth is my footstool. Now, if the earth is your footstool, what do you think God thinks of this company you created? Or your... your you know, as an Instagram influencer, your thousand followers that you have. You understand? So nothing we create, nothing we create in the physical has eternal value. So it's not what we do, it's what God does through us. Say to me, it's not what I do. It's what God does through me. So again, it's not what I do, it's what God does through me. And that's why we've got to get to the place where we are in sync with the will of God. And what you will find is usually what God wants is opposite to the flesh. It's opposite to our senses. It's opposite to what we think. We think to become rich, we've got to take and hold and keep. God says no. He says give it away. Are you hearing me here today? So it's usually the opposite. So when it comes then to fulfilling the mandate and coming to this, 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 this seed that's in the fruit, and this is what we read yesterday, that when we talk about seedless fruits, 
it's what we see now in the grocery stores. They are bred this way, chemically manipulated to make human consumption of them easier. And that's what we do. We want Christianity to be more easily consumed. But here's the thing, we become consumers. We become takers. That's not Christianity. Christianity is generosity. Christianity is giving. Christianity is overflowing. Are you hearing me? Christianity is giving things away. But for some other reason, we take. Now, now for human consumption, he says, it's, it's chemically and human manipulated. So in other words, we do the Bible because we want to be a Christian because we understand there is a God. It's not, I mean, most, 99% people believe there's a God. And even with the atheists, you know, even when that plane goes down, believe me, they start praying. God help me. There's a calling out. So that's not really, that's not really the, dis, the, 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 that's not really the discussion. That's why sitting with the atheist is the biggest waste of time. It's a facade. It's an act. It's an act. You see, when it comes to understanding that there is a God and the searching, and the searching for God, you see, we, we want to connect with God. We understand that there's a greater, greater power. But when it comes to God and it comes to Christianity, we receive God, but now we want to do God, but we want to do it in our own way, so we manipulate it for our own gain. So what happens is you manipulate your children, you manipulate your colleagues, you manipulate your spouse for your own consumption. So you tell your wife, the Bible says you must submit. You tell your wife, the Bible says, listen, yeah, I'm the head of the home. You better submit. See, now you use the Bible for your own gain. And what do you produce? You produce fruit, seedless fruit. So what is seedless fruit? Seedless fruit is fruit that cannot reproduce. So now you have a husband or you have a wife, and the way you love for your own gain, you're in the marriage for yourself. I want to be loved. Together we perfect it. No, no, you perfect it in God. You understand? You complete me. No, 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 no. Oh, my darling, you complete me. No, no, God completes you. And because God completes you, you have the ability to 100% give your spouse, give yourself to your spouse. Unconditional love. We're not talking about a 50-50% partnership. That's what the world does. So you scratch my back, I scratch your back, or whatever the terms are. You know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back twice. Do we agree? Yes, that's, we agree. But later on in the marriage, you don't feel like doing it twice anymore. You understand? Now we break the partnership and say, this partnership's not doing, let me find myself another partner. That's not love. That's a partnership. That's why many Christians, they are not married in the Christian sense. They are married in the worldly sense. In other words, they are contracted. They, it's, it's a legal uh, proceeding that's taken place, but they don't really understand the love of Christ that is unconditional, 100% of me giving. No, what are we doing? We are humanly manipulating one another. But what does that mean? You produce seedless fruit. It means as a marriage, what is produced out of that marriage is fruitless. Nothing good can come of it. So you've got to learn to do marriage God's way. Where it's a marriage, where God is the foundation. In other words, you completed in God, you're fulfilling the mandate of God, and that's why winning souls, making disciples makes you a better wife. (laughs) 
Winning souls and making disciples makes you a better husband. You see, because in winning souls and making disciples, you are laying down your life. You're living for others. You're laying down your life. You're growing your capacity. Your heart is growing. The capacity to love one more and love one more and one more person and one more family and one more neighborhood and one more school and one more university and one more nation. You see, ladies, wouldn't you rather want to be married to a man with a capacity to love? Now you go find some scully somewhere that's successful and he's got money but everything is for himself. Everything is for him. And for the rest of your life any singles in the house? Oh! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Find your husband, find your wife in the garden. In the garden. Find someone that's doing the work. You don't give yourself for cheap. No, 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 no. Look for a guy that's laying down his life. A guy that's living, he's giving himself for people. You're looking for a good wife, you look for someone that's sowing their lives into others. Are you hearing me? So, so at the end of the day, what are we producing in your disciples? Do you have disciples for your own gain? Because here's the thing, either I'm winning people, raising disciples to empower them, or I'm saying, hey, look how many disciples I have. Oh, that means seedless fruit. Seedless fruit, which means what? It means your disciples will never have fruit. Well, I've had five disciples for the last 10 years. Seedless fruit. Why? Your disciples are for your own gain. You doing it to live out your ministry is for you. It's for, you see, when you're living like that, and it's for you, to, it's seedless fruit. So what are we looking for? See, when it comes to multi-generation, we're looking for seed, seed. Say to me, seed, seed. So, so now, it, it takes time to get there. It takes time to mature. You know, as you grow up and you're a little uh, a kid and you start walking, you're not at that age where you can be fruitful. It's only from, say, teenage years or, or more or less in that place where you start developing. So there's a time of growing. There's a time of maturing and getting there. But then there's a time where you become, have the ability to produce fruit. Are you hearing me? But now the question is, what are you producing? The Bible says, and you shall be known by your, by your fruit. So your own disciples as well. There is a time where they are being consolidated, they're growing, they're learning, and, and you've got to be patient and give them time, give them a couple years and work with them, but, but teaching them to sow their lives. But eventually they've got to start producing fruit. Are you hearing me? So that's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, for though there are 10,000 instructors among you, he says there's not many fathers. You have how many instructors? You see, as Christians, we love telling people what to do. So we think that's Christianity. No, don't do that. It's wrong. Do that. No, don't do that. No, it's wrong. Do that. Ten steps how to be successful. Oh, if you fall, it's easy to instruct. Everybody can bark instructions. But a father doesn't say these are ten steps on how to be successful. He says, hey, 
Come here. You're going to be successful whether you like it or not. I will make sure you will be a success. Whatever it takes. Are you hearing me? I don't need you to like me for me to love you. You understand? I don't need your validation. But you know, many cell leaders need the validation of their disciples. They need their disciples to like them. I mean, the disciples don't answer the WhatsApp at the end of the world. It's like, oh, I'm so rejected. Oh, no, I put all my time and <laughs> it's all about you. Seedless fruit. You see, whenever it's about you, what do you produce? Seedless fruit. You'll have people that will never produce fruit. Human manipulation. You're manipulating people for your own. And it's the same with your own kids. So whatever I'm doing in the spiritual, it's the same in your family. If you have your own children and they are there for your gain and they are there for you, once again, that's what you raise. If you want your kids to like you, don't need them to like you. You are responsible to make sure that they grow up to become what God wants them to be. Whether they like it or not, they're going to be winning souls and making disciples. Hallelujah. I mean, there's not, with our children, there's not a decision, are we going to church, are you going to church? That has never in our life ever, ever been, ever been an, even a discussion in our house. When people talk, well, I don't know my child, I think, what household do you run? Do your kids eat your food? Yes. Do they stay in your house and pay rent? No. Then guess what? When you go to church, they go to church. When you go to cell, they go to cell. When you go to five o'clock uh, prayer, they go to five o'clock prayer. You see, and when you're between people that love the Lord and you're in between, uh, under the anointing the whole time, what happens? And you, they're with you and they see how you, you touch people and minister to people. They start wanting and say, I want that. I want that. I want that. I want that. When they see the influence, and, because the influence comes through doing the work. Influence doesn't come through having the position. Influence doesn't come through being the leader. It comes from doing the work. Are you hearing me? So he says, though there are 10,000 of instructors, there's not many fathers. There's not many people that say, listen, yeah, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to love you. I'm going to make you. You're going to be a disciple. I'm going to make you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to walk with you. And you know what? You will be a success. I will help you. I will, taking the responsibility, not many of those. It's easy to open the window and give the guy a two rand rather than taking responsibility for his success. That's why giving money, that's the easiest. And you struggle to give money. If you don't even give money, you're going to give nothing in your life. Ladies, don't marry a guy who makes you pay. And there's some of you ladies, some of you singles sitting here. <laughs> and you're sitting here and you know how stupid you are. No, you're sitting here. You're in some relationship with some idiot. It's getting rowdy here. Who thinks he's somebody. And you think there, and you're sitting there, and you're sitting here, you're sitting in here, you know. You know, you're sitting right now, you know that you know that you know. Unholy alliance. 
And you know what? We're going to be doing a lot of counseling because you're going to be doing a lot of crying. Listen to what I'm saying. No. God has called you. Be patient. Be patient for the right man. Be patient for the right woman. Listen to what I'm saying. No, no, no. Understand that they, they, they're ready. They're ready. You're sitting here, and they are ready. You can already see signs of how they're treating you. And you're not even married. So what do you think he's going to do when you're married? Huh? You got to run after him right now. And no, 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 no. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No. Because I know we've got some strong men in the house. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. That will love their ladies, that will serve the girls. Hallelujah. The Bible says that you must love your wife as Christ loved the church where he laid down his life well, in relation to submission, submission's easy. Laying down your life means you lay down your physical purpose. You lay that down to make sure your wife becomes what God has intended her to be. Uh, are you hearing me? Anyway, I don't know why I'm going off on this subject. Hallelujah. We'll do, we'll do some marriage stuff here as well. Hallelujah. But you see, this is what the vision does. The vision the vision, you see, when you do the vision, the vision works those things out. Because he works out our insecurities and our fears. Because we have to deal with ourselves because we're making disciples. You don't have time to be full of yourself. You don't have time to feel sorry for yourself. You don't have time to cry. You can cry five minutes over, then you've got to go again. You understand? You quickly, you quickly go, you quickly grab a tissue, you quickly go into the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. Right. Let's go win me some souls and go some make me some disciples. Hallelujah. Amen. Had a good cry. I'm over it. Hallelujah. Amen. Seedless fruit. So he says, for though there are 10,000s of instructors, there's not many fathers. Then he goes on. He says, because I have begotten you. He says, in Christ Jesus, I. In who? Christ Jesus. He says, I have begotten. The Greek word begotten is the word, Greek word gen, uh, 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 geneo, which we derive the word generations. So multi-generations. I have begotten. You're an extension of what is in the inside of me. My character. So he says, I've begotten you in Christ. Not out of myself. In Christ, I have, been, I have begotten you. So as a father, I take that responsibility towards you. So that word generations. And that's why it's not just about your seed. It's not your disciples. You shall be known by the condition of your disciples. So God's going to say, let me see. Let me know. I want to know how much you love me. Let me look at the condition of your disciples. Are they seedless? In other words, you won't rebuke because you want them to like you. So... They're running into the road. There's a bus coming. But, you know, you don't want to shout. Because, you know... <laughs> you know, you don't want to, you know, because you... What, you know, what if they don't like you? No, when you see the dangers apparent, what do you do? You run into that road. Your child is there. You grab them by the collar. And then you just like, whoosh, you understand? And you get them out of the road. The danger's there. The bus comes. You get them out of the road. And then you discipline them and say, you will not do that. 
Are you crazy? What were you thinking? What were you thinking? Not, oh, you could have died. No. Oh, oh you, you could have died. No, why did I not tell you you mustn't play on the highway? You understand, you could have died. And for you to understand how serious this, these are the consequences. You see, do you, God says he chastens those whom he loves. Now at the same time, he has the question, you can rebuke people for their empowerment or you can rebuke people because it's about you. Hey, why did you do that? Do you know how it makes me look? Oh, oh, it's about you. It's about your image. Don't do that. Do you know how it makes us look? Did you know, you, you know, it's not how it makes you look. It's got nothing to do with you. Who cares how you look? Who cares what people think anyway? People are wrong all the time anyway. What do they know what's going on in your home? What do they know what's going on in your life? So what do you care what people think? You see, so now what happens? When it's about, when you rebuke and chastise because it makes you look bad. Or say, come on, we need to win souls. Why? Because we need to meet our targets. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to look bad. Ah, seedless fruit. You see, because you're not doing it because you love people. And now you're not doing it raising your disciples so that they understand it's about the people they love. No, it's how you look. It's your image. What are you producing? Seedless fruit. So what is the goal? The goal is always multi-generations, right? So it's not seed, it's you, your seed and their seed coming from where you come from. So that's one, two, three, four generations. That's why the Bible says your blessing is always in the third and the fourth generation, not the second generation. Your blessing is never in your fruit. Your blessing will never be in your disciples. The joy of the ministry is always in your disciples' disciples. Are you hearing me? But you see, where's the hard work? It's your disciples. Where is the place where you lay down your life and you help and you grow? And that's why, see, when it comes to that blessing, now what happens, now you have depth. If we talk about a soccer team and we say, whoa, Bafana, Bafana, woo, they've got depth. What does that mean? It means we take the A team off we put the B team on, they as good as the A team. Or we take the B team off, we put the C team on. The C team is as good as the A team. Then we say, who? Oh, these guys, they've got depth. You see, maturity is shown in your depth. Oh, Pastor, we're going to a new level. What, what level? <laughs> oh, Pastor, I just feel as, as I was praying. Oh, we're going to a new level. What, what level? 12, 144. Well, what, what level? What level? First generation, second generation, child, grandchild. You understand? When you say, I'm going to, you're not going to any level unless you've produced the level. Where's the level? Who passed the arm? And only when your disciples have disciples, you're in a new level. And that's where the depth is. Who oh, passed Oh, you, I was listening to that guy. He's so deep. Deep what? 
He's so deep. Oh, so mature. Mature what? See, depth comes through your disciples. Well, I've been serving the Lord for 20 years, 30 years. Yep, you're doing one year 20 times over. You're 30 years in the church. You're still in the first year. You've done the first year 30 times. 30 years, you haven't changed. You've aged. But the question is, where's your disciples? Where's your disciples? Where's your fruit? Or is your fruit seedless? Are you hearing me? So you've got to understand this is what's so powerful. God has placed his anointing upon us to produce fruit and multi Apply. He said in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. But if you manipulate the fruit, the fruit will not produce. In other words, you're doing church for your own gain. You're coming to church for your own gain. You're doing cell for your own gain. You're being a leader for your own gain. Everything you're doing is for your own gain. When you do it, it's because you like it or you don't like it. Guess what? You're also going to stop doing it at some stage. But when, it, when you're born into the vision, when you're born into the ministry, because as a Christian, that's what needs to take place. Say, Lord, I'm going to do this, and you know, maybe I've missed it. Maybe I've raised some seedless disciples, but you're going to help me to raise some fruitful disciples. Can I get an amen there? And God help me because some of the seedless fruit that I have is not even their fault, it's my fault because I manipulated them for my own gain because what I want is laborers. See, see, look. If you talk about a mule, a mule is a mix of a horse and a donkey. You see, it's not talking about a horse, talking about bread, talking about God. There's strength, there's personality, there's, you talk about a donkey that's just, <laughs> you understand? So what we do, but we think the donkey is the horse. So what we do is we take God's word, we take God's vision, and we mix it with our, we're the donkey. We think, we take God, and we take what I think. Pastor, this is what I think. And you know, I hear what the Bible says, but. I know we need to do this, but. I understand we need to do this, but. Now you take your donkey religion and the religiosity, because that's all we, I've been doing this since I was 12 in the church. I come from or where I come from. You say, so you take the donkey and now you take the horse and what do you get? A mule. Here's the awesome thing about a mule. A mule is strong. A mule can carry a load. A mule is a work animal. Mules are incredible. Only one thing about a mule is they cannot reproduce. Are you hearing me? They can't reproduce. So you got a mule, and that's what many of us, we want people, and we use the Bible to get people submitted and committed, but we don't want them to be eagles. We don't want them to be horses. We don't want them to think for themselves. We don't want to empower them. We don't want to take time and sit and explain the Word of God. We just say, no, do what I say. I say, do it. No, no. Explain why it's important to do it. I just do it. Why? I said so. <laughs> no, if you don't understand some stuff, yeah, submit and say, okay, I don't understand. In the, in the doing, pray God that there's revelation. 
But you see, at the end of the day, there's got to be understanding. We sow our lives. We sit down with our disciples, and we explain. We give our, un- our knowledge, our understanding, our experience, uh, right and wrong, where I failed. I say, this is where I, I did that. I failed. I did that, so don't do that. I did that. I, I messed it up, got the T-shirt. You don't have to go through what I went through. So you empower. Making disciples is not getting people to work for you. Disciples is raising people up so that they can be who God has called them to be. That they can flourish where God has placed them. That they can flourish where God has called them. So it's not manipulation and control. So you've got to understand this. God gave people the right to choose. If God thought it's so important that people have the right to choose, who are we? that we can think that we have the right to take people's choice away from them. Now I can help, I can lead, I can guide, I can give advice, I give you the word, but at the end of the day, you choose who you're gonna marry. I'm not gonna say who you must marry. I can tell you, I can give you a framework to work on, but when you choose, you're never gonna be turn around and point a finger at me and say, well, Pastor Britt, you said I must marry this guy, and you said I must, ah, ah, no, 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 you marry you. You marry, you, whoever you marry, you're responsible. Your decisions you make where you go, I go, I go this work, I'm going to leave this work. God has, God has opened the door. You know, I, I'm getting an extra 3,000 rand at this place. I'm thinking, why are you moving because of money? You move because of purpose. Only, only slaves move because they're getting a little bit more money otherwise. And I'm not saying you can't move jobs. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you've got to get to that place where you learn. Now, you'll only make that mistake once. Next time you'll go to God and say, Lord, mm, I realize the devil doesn't mind me having more money if, me, if it keeps me so busy, I can't do the vision. If it keeps me so busy. And that's what the devil will do. When you start living for God, you become fruitful. It's amazing the promotions you're going to get from the devil. And a lot of it will be also in another town away from the church so that you can get out of fellowship. Now suddenly you're going to another town and another, you understand, and they, oh, no, pastor, you know, I can do it there. We'll go. Rather than hearing, hearing from God and, you know, but at the end of the day, also, it's not my decision. It's your decision. We're here to empower, certainly empower. empower. We're here to empower people. So, so the, the growth in who we are and what we do is multi-generational. Are you hearing? So what happens is uh, I need a young person. There you go. There you go. Your name? Hossi. Oh, Hossi, I can't see you behind the mask. (laughs) So I lead Hossi to Jesus. I consolidate him in the Lord. I help him where he falls, where he fails. I go picking up. He's not at church Sunday morning. I go, now, where is the guy? See, horse is not there. I don't say, well, you know, horse is not serious about Jesus. No, I phone him. I say, hey, where are you? Obviously, he doesn't answer his phone. (laughs) So I get in my car. I go to horse's house because that's just how I am. And I knock on the door, and he doesn't answer immediately because he feels guilty and whatever. He's sitting in the cupboard. But I'm relentless. Afterwards, I start making a scene, and he thinks, I better better go. Just now he's going to, the neighbors are going to think I'm crazy. And he comes out and says, yo, what's it? Why aren't you at church? Why aren't you at church? And then you go... And you can smell the party all over him. You go, what were you doing last night? Hello. I thought you gave your life to Jesus. Oh, pastor, this, this, this. And then that guy came and my friend came along. And I just went along. Pastor, I was planning. I wasn't going to drink, really. I wasn't, you know, whatever. 
Now what do I do? Now say, you see what happened? Unholy alliances. You see, so, so now what do I do? I disciple. So he fell, but I don't kick him to the curb. I say, come on, let's get up. We're going to church. I said, you missed this morning. We've got another service. We can still make it in time. Or we go to tonight's service. You understand? But we're going to church. You see, that's taking responsibility. That's consolidating. Taking responsibility for somebody. Now what happens is as I grow, he follows me. You know, and I say, you know, I'm going to make you. Follow me and I will make you. And wherever I go, he goes. And he sees what I do. I model. Say it me, model. model. There you go. I model. And I make phone calls. And he hears how I speak to people. And he hears how I... I, I help people, I correct people, and I love people. And he learns from me, and he grows from me. And now, now I understand, now I've got, to, I've got to help him to develop, because if he doesn't produce fruit, he will, he will even as a Christian, stay a narcissist. It's, he'll be like this. I've got to teach him now to be fruitful. So after a while now, I teach him and I, I show him how to win souls, and then eventually he goes, and he goes and gets a soul. You see, now, now what I've done, I have produced fruit, but I've produced fruitful fruit that can multiply. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? So I have now, I have now with who I am, as he has followed me, now he learns, and where I go, he goes, where he goes, he goes. So, so I'm learning, and I'm doing, and he's learning from me, and you're learning from him, and we're growing, and we go, and now and then, he wants to go do his own thing, and I say, Jose, grab the guy. Hey. You know? You know? Go. <laughs> Where were you last night? And he helps him and he loves him. You understand? So what I've done is I've, I've, I've taken who I am and I have begotten in Jesus Christ, not Bert Pretorius. He doesn't need to have my personality. Are you hearing me? So don't dis distinguish between those things. It's the spiritual aspect, not the physical aspect. Are you hearing me? He's still his own person. He's still got a purpose of God in his life. There's still things that he's going to do which I can't do. Because he's got gifts and talents upon his life. What am I? I'm here to produce Jesus in him. Are you hearing me? And he does the same. And I teach him to produce Jesus in his disciple. But now my job, my job is not complete. Because I have raised a disciple that produces fruit. But if I have not taught him to produce fruitful fruit... I still have failed. So having disciple doesn't mean I've achieved. Having a disciple that has a disciple, still I haven't completed my task. Because he can produce seedless fruit. That means it stops with him. There's no legacy. It doesn't continue. So I have to teach him and help him to disciple um, his disciple, that he doesn't do it for his own gain to say, hey, look how many disciples I have. Or did you know what I did? And it's all about me. And it's, you know, and he's trying to prove himself to me. I've got to get him to the place where what he does is, can we sort the sound out? Thank you. What I've got to do is get him to the place where he does what he does not for me. Because if, if I'm not around, he's not going to do it anymore. So he mustn't do stuff to please me. I have to mature him in Christ to the place that what he does, he does for the Lord. You understand? 
what he does. Whether I'm there or not there, it's a passion he has. And that's now when he does that, I've got to get him to produce fruit that produces fruit. There you go. Hey, come, come, come. Cool. There you go. Look, he chose a tough disciple. <laughs> this disciple, when he looked at him already, he was going like this. He had decided already, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a disciple. I don't want to make a disciple. I'm done. There's no disciple for me. But what did he do? He persisted. He says, you will follow me, whether you like it or not. Where you go, I go. And where does he go, where he goes? Where does he go, where I go? You understand? And wherever we go. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So once again, we're talking about multi-generation. That's disciples. So it's not about me. It's not about how many I have. It's not about the numbers. And not that numbers are not important. It's important because you need to know. <laughs> there you go. You see, and I've got to get him to get him to get him to the place where it's not about a selfie. You understand? <laughs> so, so. Hallelujah. Now, now you've got to you've got to look at the you've got to look at the, 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 the context of these relationships and what type of relationships they are. Your relationship with your disciple is a personal relationship. It's not an easy relationship. It's hard work. It's consistency, it's discipline, it's prayer, it's fasting. Your disciples keep you on your knees. Sometimes you can't, these guys, you can't do anything but pray. You understand? They don't take your WhatsApp calls, they don't take anything, they don't take your WhatsApp and hallelujah. Now you get to there, you get on your knees and you say, Lord, strike them. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, not Lord strike them. Lord help them. Help them. I'm here at this place where I can't do it anymore. I need you. But I've said doesn't help. It doesn't work. I'm beyond my personality. My personality, you see, when you do discipleship, your personality doesn't, doesn't cut it. Your education doesn't cut it. Nothing. You need supernatural guidance from the Lord. Are you hearing me? Now, the context of this relationship is... is, is um, it, it, there's the intimacy that's there, but also there's a lot of conflict because I have to cl conflict the behavior of the world that's contrary to the Word of God. And I'm the only person in his life doing that. You understand? And I'm responsible for that. And because I love Horsey, I conflict certain things. Why? Because I want him to become everything that God wants him to be. And if he's going off on the wrong direction, I have to, I have to conflict that. So, so conflict is the name of the game. If you don't like conflict, you'll never do discipleship. If you don't like conflict, you'll never be a Christian. The foundation of Christianity is conflict. We conflict the world. We conflict the nature and the heart of the world. So we're always going to stand in conflict. So you mustn't be scared of conflict, but when we love, when we help, when there's conflict, it's not conflict for the sake of conflict. It's conflict to love and to help. Are you hearing me? And everything we do, we do in love. Say with me, in love. So this relationship can get heated, it can get strained at times, but that's why under the power of the Holy Spirit, if there is no conflict in a relationship, any relationship that has not been tested cannot be trusted.
Once your disciple has nearly been gone and comes back, now you know they can be trusted. But if you've been buddies all the time and you haven't had conflict, don't trust that relationship. It's only when there's been conflict and say, look, irrespective of the conflict, I'm still going to be here. Why do you say that to me? What do you mean I'm saying that to you? Ah, the, you know what you talk to me? Da, 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 da. Ah. You're going to leave? No. I can't take it anymore. You're always on me. You're always on my case. You know what the pressure, I can't, can't take this anymore. You know, yeah, you know what, I, I, I'm done. Okay, you gone? No. Where do I go? Like with Jesus. The crowd left him. Everybody left him. There Jesus is standing and just the 12 is left. 15,000 people left. He's got 12 people left. He turns to them and he says, and you, where are you going? Are you guys going? Peter says, huh? What do you mean? Where am I going? I don't know where to go. You understand? You're stuck with me. You can call me Satan. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Get thee behind me, Satan. Mm, okay. Are you hearing me? You see, now that intimacy. You see, now you understand why in discipleship, when you do discipleship when it comes to marriage, you see, now when it comes to the next relationship, their relationship is like that, like I have with Horsey. But now my relationship with my third generation, the context is different. It's like a grandfather. You, un you understand? So, so what happens in, in the context of this relationship, I can help Horsey in the developing of the disciples to the degree of how he portrays me to his disciple. Are you hearing me? If you cover your father's nakedness, because no one's perfect. So the day he goes and he says, yo, you know what, whew. The guy says, why are you so sad? Oh, yo, I was with Pastor Bert, and yo, you know, I can't just take it. It's so hectic. You know, I can't do that. Now what happens, he speaks about it. Then he goes, prays, and he's over it. He never recovers. You see, now what happens, because he's speaking to his disciple. You never speak to your disciples about your issues. So, so what happens is he, 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 he paints a picture now when he's, Horsey comes to me and he says, oh, Pastor Bert, can you help me with this disciple? I'm really struggling. Can you come speak into his life? Now when I need to speak into his life, I have zero authority. You understand? But if he covers me, if he covers me, in other words, what he portrays is what I have placed within his life according to Jesus Christ. See, now he says, okay, can you help me? Now what happens when I speak into his life and I say, hey, you know what? This guy loves you. You need to trust him. See, because many guys, they struggle with trust. They've been hurt. They've been rejected. They've been abused. They've never had a relationship where they could trust anybody. Then I, I, I say, hey, this guy loves you. Why do you think he's taking the time to help you, phone you? Why does he need to do that? He doesn't need to do that. Now I can speak and speak into his life. And guess what? Now he appreciates that because he sees me. When Horsey speaks to me, he says, whoo, Pastor Bert, he's awesome. He's helped me so many times and whatever. And now he respects me. And when I speak, what I say into his life carries more weight than what he carries because of him. You understand? So the grandfather, grandmother spirit is so, so important. That's why the multi-generation, first of all, having a first generation, but it's not about the first generation. The joy of the ministry is the third generation. And the fourth generation, that dude doesn't even know me. He just wants a selfie. <laughs> right? Are you hearing me? He doesn't know. He doesn't know what goes on between us. 
and how I need to sort him out and how I need to challenge him and now how I need to, I mean, he doesn't know. He just, see, this guy sorts him out. You understand? Now, when I speak into his life, guess what? It's like, oh, thank you, pastor. Oh, yes. You understand? He receives it. <laughs> Amen? Right? Yes. Although this is tough. You see, now what happens? The ministry becomes a joy. You see, when you only got one generation, that's the hard work. You haven't yet tasted. You haven't yet tasted. You haven't yet tasted. You've just been working. Now what you've got to be patient. It comes over time. Chinese prophet says the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is, is now. The best time to disciple, 20 years ago, you're 20 years late. Okay? But the second best time is today. Not tomorrow. Today. Start pouring your life. Why? It takes years. We're not talking about quick fix. Raising the children, 18, 19, 20 years. We're not talking quick fix. No, we're talking about solid relationships that can stand the test of time. Stand the test of time. You understand? Through the trust that we build. And God is reflected in that. That's why we've got to take a lot of communion. Because there's a lot of forgiving that needs to be done every day. Every day I have to choose life and not death and offense. Every day. Are you hearing me? Then what happens when you choose life? You live and? See, the problem, the problem is people make disciples two, three years, and then they take, they take offense. Now, all they've experienced is the work, the hard work of planting. They haven't seen their fruit multiply. You haven't experienced the next generation and you give up five years into the ministry, you know, six years into the ministry, you give up, you take offense, you, you choose death, you decide, okay, I'm not doing this G12 thing, I'm not doing the my, making disciples, you know, I see it's in the Bible, but I'm going to do my own brand of Christianity. You give up, you give up at some other stage. And guess what? You lose out on the beauty and the joy of having a generation, and another generation. You understand what I'm saying? See, here is depth. Here's the depth. Not in I've been serving God 20 years. Show me your disciples. Show me your disciples' disciples. Show me your disciples' disciples' disciples. Are you hearing me? Or are you producing? Some of us don't even have disciples. You don't even have fruit. Never mind seedless fruit. Hello. Are you hearing me? Now, let me close with this. As I have produced this, I have now completed the cycle. Now, if I've done that, then I can, then I know I've done, because I've produced fruit that produces fruit. Now I've duplicated myself. Now I can say, see, people say, well, I've duplicated myself in an individual. No. You only duplicate it when you have a fourth generation. Because you've got to, you need the quality. Quality means reproduction. You understand? Now, when I've done this, I've reproduced, I've only duplicated myself. Now, if I want to multiply myself, I've got to do this twice. Are you hearing me? Now, it's once, twice, or like Jesus, how many times? How many? 12. And Jesus could only do 12. Oh, I, I, no, no. Jesus had 12 disciples. And through his disciples, he discipled others. You guys can take a seat. Give them a great hand. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The seed is in the fruit. Don't manipulate the fruit. Let's trust the Lord. God will do the work. Just be faithful. Just be 
faithful. Don't be full of yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. Come before the Lord where you've messed up. Come before the Lord. It's your and if you've done something stupid, come before God. Repent. No one's perfect. God worked your mess in you. God worked your issues. You understand? He's got purpose for your life. So chill. Get to God. Ask God to help you, forgive you, change you, transform you. You can't be fruitful out of yourself. So stop trying to be fruitful. Be faithful and you will multiply. Why? The anointing of God is upon you to do what? To multiply. Are you blessed? Yes. Come on, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you just stand to your feet to stay where you are? Become aware of the presence of God. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You see, you've got to be birthed into the vision. Otherwise, you've got to try it. It's not about trying. It's like giving your life to Jesus. When there's a calling upon your life, you've got to be birthed into the calling. Like me being in the ministry, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to try this. It's not trying it, I do it. If it doesn't work, I change how I do it. If it's not working, then I still know. I've got to do it, I'm just doing it wrong. I've got to, you understand, there's no ways I'm going to stop doing it, I'm going to do it till I get it right. See, when it's birthed in you, and no matter how difficult it is, doesn't matter how many years it takes, it doesn't matter, that guy's going, woo, and I got the other two, it doesn't matter. I still know that's what I need to do. See, when it's birthed on the inside and you know that's God's calling upon your life, just stay where you are. Lift up your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Become aware of the presence of God in this place. God has called you to be fruitful and to multiply, to raise up generations for Him, to produce fruit that produces fruit that remains. That's God's desire for your life. That's the calling of God. That's the anointing that God has placed upon your life. And we're wallowing here in our circumstances and our mess. No, no, no. You're beautifully and wonderfully made. God's got purpose. God's got purpose for your life. But we can't take our brand of Christianity and mix it with God. No, Jesus had 12. Jesus raised disciples. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to be fathers, not instructors. Not telling people what to do, but getting involved in people's lives and saying, we're going to walk a path. We're going to walk together in relationship. I'm going to make sure you become that which God wants you to be. I'm going to take responsibility for you. Now, as your hands are raised, say with me, thank you, Lord. You have called me. I'm not called by a man, <laughs> but Lord, I'm called by you. You called me. You chose me so that I could go and bear fruit, fruit that remains. Lord, forgive me for doing my own brand of church, my own brand of Jesus. I died to myself. I make a decision today to choose life, to do what you called me to do. Out of myself, I can't do this, Lord, but I trust you. So I submit to you. Thank you, Lord. You make me fruitful through your Holy Spirit, through the anointing of God. I will multiply to become that which you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise.